Good evening. Tonight we're going to conclude our three-week study of the book of Habakkuk. So at this time, if you will, please get your Bibles or your device in which you read the Word of God on and uh, go ahead and turn there or, or uh, click to the book of Habakkuk. And we're going to be in chapter 3. Chapter 3. We've been trying to break it down each week um, as we kind of maneuver through this particular book. It's, it's a very short book uh, written by the prophet here. It's a very unique book as you have an instance where the prophet of God enters into a dialogue with God throughout the book. And so it's different than a lot of other uh, books that were written by prophets in the Old Testament in that we don't really have a, a, a moment where um, the focus is on Habakkuk actually uh, prophesying to people on behalf of God, but rather this is more of a, a communication between God and Habakkuk in which Habakkuk is pleading with God on behalf of the people. And so it's a, a unique uh, book of prophecy, a unique book written by one of our prophets here, and uh, I think it provides a lot of insight into uh, just life as you kind of think about things that we go through in our lives as Christians, things that we might be uh, having to endure at this point in time. And I think it's a great representation. If you remember, uh, we're going to look at just, a, we're not going to spend time reading all the verses, but the verses will be on the screen. But we're going to review briefly where we've been the last two weeks, and then we'll spend the remainder of our time at uh, the chapter three of this particular book. But remember, you, you have Habakkuk is surrounded by injustice and pain and suffering and evil, and it, there's darkness all around him. Not it doesn't seem it's not that it seems bleak. It's it's dark. It, it's it's a tough time. And with that in mind, Habakkuk kind of goes through this process of a struggle of faith at the beginning, where there's a lot of questioning uh, God to a life of faith where God says, you know, the life of faith, you walk by faith by doing this. And we're going to look at those things again. And then it concludes with this wonderful song of faith. And in the lives of Christians, in our lives, I think we kind of see a similar, uh, a similar uh, transition, if you will, where whenever we're going through some difficult situations and we're hit with some tough times, uh, we find ourselves struggling in faith. There is a struggle of faith. Not that we're doubting God necessarily, but that uh, there are questions that arise because of the situation that we're in and the things that we're having to go through. So these questions arise. This struggle is happening within and without, and it leads to the life of faith saying, I'm going to trust in God, and I'm going to wait and lean on God's timing through this situation and then it results ultimately in this song of faith where we praise God for helping us through the trial, the struggle, the situation that we find ourselves in. But as we kind of look back, very briefly here, we're going to go fast. It's rapid fire. I encourage you to go back and look at the last two weeks' lessons. Uh, as we, we The whole title of the series is When God Doesn't. This idea that what happens when God doesn't answer the way we expect Him to answer and he doesn't answer on our timing. What, what happens in those moments when God doesn't respond the way we want him to or expect him to? How do we respond in that situation? That's kind of what this series is about. Do we, like Habakkuk, finding ourselves in, uh, ultimately ending up with this song of praise, this song of faith to God? because of what he has done and what he continues to do? Or do we find ourselves, because God hasn't answered the way we expected or in the time that we expected him to answer, do we find ourselves drifting further from God and wallowing in that struggle rather than transitioning to this point of singing the praises of God? That's kind of what we're looking at with this book here. And so as we look, this is our rapid-fire review. The first part here was the struggle of faith, and it's in chapter 1, and it's in the first four verses of chapter 1. And so, um, real quick, it, it, there are questions that Habakkuk is struggling with. First, does God hear? Does he really hear me? Secondly, does God care? Does he even care about what I'm going through? Which ultimately leads us to the question of, is God really good? 
A lot of people ask this question. A lot of worldly people, this is why they struggle with even believing in God because of the evil that surrounds them. It ultimately comes down to this question, is God truly good? And we spent time the first week addressing these questions. So again, I urge you to go back and look at that lesson. But for our sake, I just want you to kind of remember to follow the thoughts of Habakkuk here. So is God good? So, uh, next, is God holy? Uh, Habakkuk then asked, where is God's power in all of this? What about God's strength, uh, word rather? Where is God's power? Where is God's word? He then asks, will God show that he is just? And ultimately, all of these questions come together and culminate into the, this main question of, is God really worthy of my trust? If Does he listen to me? Does he even care? Is he good? Where is his power? All these questions ultimately lead us to this point of wondering, is God worthy of my trust if I'm struggling with all of these questions? Well, then we talked last week about God's reply to Habakkuk, and it's in verses 5 through 11 of chapter 1. And in those verses, what we see is God not even addressing the questions Habakkuk has answered, but God responds in this way that is kind of just uh, confusing in, in a way to Habakkuk because he responds by saying, well, I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans who will eventually be known as the Babylonians. I'm going to raise up this evil, awful, terrible people and they're going to take over my people because of the way my people are living right now. And Habakkuk is confused as to why God's going to use this evil nation to take over his nation. And so there's this struggle that Habakkuk is dealing with um, but ultimately, it leads to this other complaint in verses 12 through 17. Habakkuk has this second uh, period of questioning that happens. And ultimately, I want you to go back and read that on your time. But through this, God comes back with, you know, you want to know how you get through what you're in right now. You want to know how you endure and overcome the struggle of faith and, and you overcome uh, God's answers to your questions that don't make sense. It's the life of faith, and it's in this life of faith uh, that we found our um, answers for last week. Um, so as we examine the life of faith, you go back to chapter 2, verses 2 through 4 are the three most important verses of the whole book, the entire book. You, you see uh, what God basically says here. Verse 4, the last part of verse 4, but the just shall live by his faith. That is our key phrase in the entire book. From the struggle of faith to the life of faith, God says to the prophet Habakkuk, to his people, here's how you endure and walk through suffering. You do it by faith. And how does that look? How does it look to walk by faith? And last week we covered that when we said, number one, we listen to the truth of God's word. Our thinking can lead us all kinds of different ways. Our emotions can lead us all kinds of different ways. The advice we get from other people can lead us all kinds of different ways. But God's word, his truth, is the rock upon which we can stand amidst the storms of life. It is the compass which, when we get off track, it brings us back to center. It realigns our focus. God's word is truth. We must listen to the truth of God. We walk by faith and, and live by faith by learning to lean on the timing of God. Lean on the timing of God. His timing is not our timing, and that's difficult and frustrating at times, but we lean on His timing because we're trusting in His Word. We trust in His Word, and therefore we lean on His timing, which ends up being that we live with our trust in God. We live with our trust in God for our salvation, and amidst our suffering, we live with our trust in God. And then, ultimately, we look forward to the triumph of God. And there are two verses towards the end of chapter 2 where we kind of, there are kind of verses that we can see some pretty important things to remember. Look forward to the triumph of God. The first part is verse 14 where it talks about that he is going to show his glory. The earth is going to be full of his glory. And also with that and connecting with that, we will stand in awe. And so the life of faith tells us, tr listen to the truth of God. 
listen to his word and lean on his timing. His timing isn't your timing. His thoughts aren't your thoughts. So you listen to his truth. You lean on his timing and you live with your trust in him. Your trust for salvation. Your trust amidst the suffering that you're going through. And ultimately through all of this as we listen to his truth. As we lean on his timing. As we live with our trust in him. We are looking forward to his triumph. When the earth is full of his glory and when everyone will stand in awe. And then ultimately, eventually, every knee is going to bow at the name of Jesus. All of this, every bit of it, leads us ultimately to where we are now in chapter 3, where we're going to be tonight. And that is with the song of faith. This last chapter is absolutely amazing. What Habakkuk does is is he reviews the greatness of God through the history of his people. And I want you to notice what Habakkuk does as we read. We're going to see that these deep questions over in chapter 1 and in chapter 2 as you kind of move through, these deep, honest questions lead to deep and honest praise in chapter 3. We're gonna, what I want us to do is we're going to read the chapter and we're going to pause along the way and talk about some of the things that Habakkuk is, is praising in this song of faith. It's amazing. This is meant to be a song. You're supposed to sing it. That's how uh, uh, praiseworthy it is. That's how wonderful this is. We want to praise God with this song that is penned. I'm not going to sing for you because I don't want to ruin your evening and I don't want you to never listen to me again. But um, I'll, we're going to read it together. And I want you to notice what Habakkuk says about God, about his greatness. And I I want you to cling to these things in the midst of your suffering. As you find yourself struggling in faith during your trials, and you're trying to walk and live by your faith, I want you to cling to these things that can help bring us to this point of this song of faith. So we're going to read and pause along the way. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigianoth. O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. First, Habakkuk says, God is awesome. God is awesome. Look at verse 2 again, the first part of the verse. Heard your speech and, and was afraid. If you remember last week, we talked about Job and how at the beginning of Job, you you see how Job, after he's tried and, and he loses everything, that he rips his clothes and he, he praises and worships God. But at chapter, at chapter 42, you notice Job says, he says, God, I had heard of you, but now I see you. And that's kind of what we have here. I have heard your speech and was afraid. Now you have this shifting. I've heard your speech, and God, I, I fear you. Not cowering in the corner. Please don't hurt me. But it is a fear, a reverential fear. He says, "God, I revere you. I have heard you, and I revere. I respect. I fear you in this respectful and reverential way." God, number one, is awesome. We continue, in the midst of the years, make it known, in wrath, remember mercy. Habakkuk says, God is full of wrath. Look at verse 2 again, that that in wrath, remember mercy. When you go back to chapter 2 and you look at the the, um, pieces there where uh, God is is addressing Habakkuk's second complaint, you see um, the woes that God has there that he pronounces upon the Chaldeans, what he's going to eventually do to the Chaldeans, to the Babylonians. Yes, they might for a moment take over God's people, but they will uh, endure and receive the wrath of God because of their sinfulness and their evil. They, They are going to receive God's wrath because of those things. God is full of wrath. You see that God will indeed show the full extent of his wrath to sin and sinner alike. And that is a fearful thing. The Bible tells us it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God because God is wrathful. Those who live in sin and refuse to leave sin behind, those who who just stay committed to sin and refuse to repent and turn to God, they will eventually receive justice, and that justice is going to, to 
end up meaning they endure the wrath of God because of sin. But thankfully, for those that repent of sin and turn to God, those that become a Christian through the waters of baptism, those that give their life to Christ, those individuals, thankfully, he's full of wrath, but also God is full of mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. And so while God is full of wrath, that doesn't mean that we must fear that wrath in the sense that we're scared to stand before him, but rather we can celebrate the fact that as his children, we get to receive mercy, which says you deserve my wrath, but I'm not going to to give you my wrath. Justice says you deserve this. Here's your payment. You get what you deserve. Mercy says you uh, deserve this, but I don't want to give that to you. I don't want you to have to endure that. And thankfully, as his children, we don't have to endure his wrath because God is also full of mercy. As we continue in verse 3, God came from Timon, the Holy One from Mount Paran. God is present in all creation. This here, the first part of verse 3, is a reference to when in, in the first few verses there of Deuteronomy 33, if you go back and look at the first few verses of Deuteronomy 33, God comes down from Mount Sinai. He reveals himself to his people from Mount Sinai. God is present in all of creation. This, for us, is really, really good news. You see, in the midst of suffering, your God is not distant from you. He is present with you. In the midst of our suffering, our God is not present from us, or excuse me, distant from us. He is present with us. Remember, the silence of God does not equal his absence in our trials and in our suffering. He is with us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. It's a promise made by God, and he doesn't break promises. God is present in all creation. He is with you in the valley when you are suffering. He never leaves you alone. You are never alone in your suffering. Please, please never forget that. You are never alone in your suffering. And not only is God present in all of his creation, but God is praised by all of his creation. Look at the last part of verse 3. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. You might see the word selah there. Pause, contemplate, think about. Contemplate God's glory, his goodness, his greatness, covering the heavens, filling the earth. God is present with his creation, and his creation praises his name. God is praised by his creation. And verses 4 through 11, we're going to read these together here. Habakkuk the prophet continues, His brightness was like the light. He had rays flashing from his hand, and there his power was hidden. I want you, as we read this, listen to the imagery here, okay? Listen to the imagery as we continue. Before him went pestilence, and and fever followed at his feet. Verse 6, He stood and measured the earth. He looked and startled the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills bowed. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian trembled. O Lord, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation? Your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrows. You divided the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still still in their habitation. At the light of your arrows they went, at the shining of your glittering spear. Habakkuk says, God has power over all things. Look at the imagery that we just read. God has power over nature and over nations. He has power over mountains and over oceans. He has power over disease and over death. Uh, and, uh, and excuse me, over disease and over death. God has power over all things, and going with this, God is sovereign 
in all things. All of nature and all nations at his fingertips for his purposes. There is not one ounce of creation, not one event in history that God is not totally sovereign over. When you heard or maybe when you hear that diagnosis from the doctor that you dread, know this. In that moment, God is absolutely on his throne and he is not surprised. When you get that phone call or when you got that phone call or when you get that phone call that changes everything. World turned upside down. Life totally different. Life shattered. Know this. God was and is and will be on his throne. He is sovereign over all of that. And this sovereign God who reigns on his throne over everything, this is really, really good when you realize this next point. Look at verses 12 and 13. You marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointed. You struck the head from the house of the wicked by laying bare from foundation to neck. As you think about the sovereignty and the reign of God, this is really, really, really good news because God, our next point here in verses 12 and 13, God is the protector of his people. He is the protector of his people. It is good to be on God's side. You really want to be on God's side. Isn't it good to know? Just, just let this soak in this evening as you're listening to this. Child of God, people of God, the God who has power over all things in the universe, the God who is sovereign over all things in the universe, that God is is your protector. He'll protect you. Come what may, bring what may, I will not fear. God will protect me. What can man do to me when I think about what God does for me? And not only this, God is the deliverer of his people. Look at verse 14. You, th you thrust through with his own arrows the head of his villages. They came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. You walk through the sea with your horses through the heap of great waters. God is the deliverer of his people. Look at verse 16. When I heard, my body trembled. My lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes to the people, he will invade them with his troops. God is the protector, and he is the deliverer of his people. He delivered his people from Egypt. He delivers his people from sin and from Satan. Here's the scene. As, as we kind of look through all of these amazing points so far, the picture here, all of this leads to the last three verses of, of chapter 3. You see the, the key point verses in, in verses 2 through 4 of chapter 2, but these are incredibly powerful verses at the end of chapter 3. It's all culminating, it's all leading us to this Point. As Habakkuk is looking over everything, as he's thinking of the history of his people and the greatness of God, he gets to this point in chapter 3. Here is the, the scene, the three stunningly beautiful verses. This is the scene of them. Habakkuk has wrestled with God. The circumstances around him are dark on every side. Suffering, pain, injustice, and there's no sign of anything changing. And this, through this wrestling, through this struggle, this is Habakkuk's conclusion.
conclusion. Let's look at verse 17. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high heels. Verse 17, Habakkuk concludes this. Everything, though everything is gone, look at what he said. No fig tree on, may not blossom, no fruit on the vines, the labor of the olive fail, fields yield no food, the flock cut off from the fields, there's no herd in the stalls. Habakkuk says, though everything is taken away or though every single thing is gone, here is Habakkuk's conclusion. God is our satisfaction, verses 17 and 18. God is our satisfaction. As you look at God being our satisfaction, Habakkuk doesn't just say that he'll trust in the Lord, but he says that I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation because God doesn't just sustain God satisfies. Though everything is absent and everything is lacking, God satisfies. This, this is true happiness. A depth of happiness. Joy, a joy, a rejoicing that says everything is taken away from me, yet I still have God, so I still have joy. Because God sustains me and ultimately, God satisfies me. He satisfies what I need. God is our satisfaction, and God is our strength. Verse 19, the Lord is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high heels. He upholds me, makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me walk on my high heels, or your translation might say high places, let me tell you, in battle, you, you're probably familiar with this, but in battle, high places are where you want to be. High places are where you conquer from, the, the places where you rule from, where you reign from. You want to be on the high places, and God puts us on the high places. He is our satisfaction. He is our strength. Listen to this. Habakkuk says, in the midst of suffering, with God's strength and His satisfaction, He leads me to the high place where no matter what is raging around me, I can not only survive in the midst of it, but I can find a way to thrive because God satisfies and God strengthens. And ultimately, God is our victory. He is our victory. He puts us on the mountaintop as a victor. He places us as a victor on the mountaintop and a conqueror in the midst of our suffering. It does, it does seem weird to us, right? This hard truth of Habakkuk that God would use painful experiences to accomplish his sovereign purposes, that seems weird. Just like when you hear in James that you should count it all joy when you receive tribulation and you have to go through various trials, that seems weird to us. Why should I rejoice when I struggle and am going through through pain and hurtful experiences, harmful experiences. It seems weird, but I want to remind us of something that is far, far, far weirder than this truth in Habakkuk. Something that is far more difficult for us to comprehend. And that is the comforting reality of the cross the comforting reality of the cross. You see, that is this, that God uses His Son's suffering to accomplish His people's salvation. Yes, God's ways in Habakkuk may seem strange. That he's going to use the Chaldeans to, to take over and, and overthrow His people for right now. That may seem strange that God would do this. And God's ways in our lives at times may seem strange. His, his, his answers to our prayers may seem strange or weird or what we weren't expecting. But ultimately, look to the cross. 
For there God takes the penalty, the penalty of our sin that's due us, due our lives, and he pours it out on his son. And he takes the pain of his son to bring us peace. We deserve, we deserve death because of sin. But we can experience peace because of Christ's death. Because of our sins. It may seem weird that Habakkuk would use an evil people to take over, or that God would use an evil people here in Habakkuk to take over his people. It may seem weird that God is doing what he's doing in your life right now. But look to the cross and be reminded of how strange it is and how crazy it is that God would use His Son, His perfect Son, suffering, who did no, no wrong, He would use His suffering to bring about our salvation. As you think about this, His pain brings us peace. His death brings us life. And we find salvation in His suffering. We find salvation in the suffering. And because of his sufferings for our sins in our place, and because of his victory over sins on our behalf, because of Christ's death on the cross and resurrection from the grave, we know and we can know this. We can put our trust in this. First of all, our suffering, our suffering is temporary. Whether it ends in this life or the next, our suffering is temporary. Cancer is temporary. Tumors are temporary. Trials are temporary. Pain is temporary. Hurt is temporary. Disease is temporary. This COVID-19 stuff is temporary. Disaster is temporary. And death itself is temporary. But Christ is eternal. Our suffering is temporary. One day we'll be with God. And there will be no pain, there will be no disease, there will be no tears shed, there will be no hurt, no separation. There will only be rejoicing and joy and praise for the God who made it possible. For the Savior who died in my place for my sins. Our suffering is temporary and it's hard, it is so hard to remember that in the midst of suffering. It is so hard to remember that when the storms of life rage on and pick up in intensity. But we have to cling to that reality. That suffering, no matter how painful, is only temporary. Christ is eternal. So, thrust yourself upon Him Thrust yourself upon the eternal God who reigns sovereign over all things, who will protect and deliver you from whatever you're going through and realize that your suffering is only temporary and our God, while our suffering is temporary, our God is trustworthy. I told you that last question there in our first lesson with the struggle of faith, is God worthy of trust? Absolutely. Our God is is trustworthy. He will lead us all to conclude, though there are no figs on the tree and no fruit in the field, though everything is taken from us, we can rejoice in our God. Take joy in his salvation and stand strong on the high places because of his glory. Praise be to God that he protects and delivers us. Praise be to God that suffering is only temporary. I don't know what you're going through tonight. I don't know if you're hurting because of something in connection with this virus or if you're hurting because of something in connection with your job, which also might be connected to the virus in some way. I don't know if you're hurting because of sin. I don't know if you're hurting because of some other illness that's not in any way related to COVID-19, but it is a very serious illness that you're having to battle. 
I don't know what suffering you right now are having to go through. But I hope that you can look at the book of Habakkuk and realize it's healthy and it's okay to struggle with that suffering and to ask questions, to pour your heart out to God and let Him hear what's on the inside. It's okay. And after you do that, as you do that, go to the right places for the answers to those questions. Lean on the truth. Listen to the truth of God and lean on His timing. I don't know if your suffering is going to be relieved in this life, but I know that your suffering will be relieved. If it's not in this life, it will be in eternity. So trust in God and sing the song of faith. Praise God because He is awesome and He is worthy of our praise and He is trustworthy. He delivers us. He protects us. He satisfies us. God is always with us and we are never alone. So whatever you're going through tonight, I hope you can find a way to get from the struggle of faith to the song of faith. If you're listening this evening and you're not a child of God, I promise you, every other place that you go and every other person that you turn to, every other thing that you turn to, will not satisfy the emptiness and the hurt that you are experiencing. There's only one way to receive relief from that emptiness and that hurt. There's only one way to get away from the suffering and experience true joy, and that is to give your life to Christ. If you're willing to to, to repent of your sins this evening, to confess Jesus is the Son of God, and to be baptized into Christ this evening, then as you go down into the watery grave of baptism, the waters of, of baptism, the blood of Jesus washes away your sins. God meets us there. He cleanses us with the blood of His Son that was shed for us, for our sins, so that we can come up out of the watery grave a new person. And just as Jesus left the grave behind and moved on, you and I can leave behind that grave with that old person in it, and we can push forward, living for God, singing His praises. Tonight, if you need to become a Christian, please do so. If you're listening and you're hurting and you are a child of God, lean upon His promises and trust in your God. Sing the song of faith. Know that this suffering is temporary and God is going to deliver you from it. Whether now or whether later, He will make you victorious over your suffering. If you have a need tonight, my cell phone number is 850-559-9575 and we here at Last Cast just want to do whatever we can to accommodate that need, to help meet that need. If you need to obey the gospel, call that number, text that number, I'll meet you at the building tonight, and we can take care of that need. If you are a child of God and you need prayers and you want to talk to somebody about what you're going through, you can call that number, and I, I, I can be a pretty good listener if you need just someone to listen, and then we can pray together. But if you have a need, please, please don't go on hurting in your life. Please don't just live in the struggle of faith, but allow yourself to transition from the struggle to the life and ultimately to the song of faith. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope that you and your family are staying healthy. Take care, and God bless.